So uh, I just like to welcome you, Geek Fire Nation interviews with the Farscape folks. I interviewed Ben Browder yesterday, and now I'm talking to Rockne S. O'Bannon, writer and creator of Farscape, uh, among other shows like Alien Nation, Sequest, Sequest DSV, and I really want to credit you with uh, coming up with the boy from Uncle. Um, but <laughs> you heard about that. did, did <laughs> that ever get off the ground? <laughs> No, I, I I wrote it when I was ten years old, so uh, yeah, yeah. I don't think it was quite. <laughs> I was quite ready to show run at that time, but uh, yeah, thank you. Someday, maybe. Um, yeah, it, it's still a possibility. I mean, like Absolutely. we we had the man from Uncle um, movie and everything. Like we could still TV loves to make things that uh, they they've already done before. So that's for sure. Since we're we're celebrating Farscape now, it's its twenty fifth anniversary. I don't think I have to tell you I'm a huge fan. I've been rewatching the series leading up to these interviews, and I have come up with a few questions. One of them is that making Farscape seemed like a, a very uphill battle at certain points, uh, if not continuously. Was there ever like a fight that you had to have for? the show that um for like a script a story or an episode or something like that that you got the most pushback from but you just you had to have it um for for the story's characters it's a great question and I, if you ask me that question about any other series i've ever worked on i would be able to give you a, a, examples in every one of them mm -hmm. uh but not with farscape i mean this is why farscape i think was just uh, you know, lightning in a bottle was because we just were essentially free to do whatever we wanted to do as wild as we wanted to. Um, and uh, the, it kind of stemmed from the very um, uh, the earliest days. Um, we had sold the show to the Sci-Fi Channel here in the States. And um, and then the uh, president of the network, uh, Sci-Fi Channel, um, who had bought it, moved on. And so someone else came in and, and took his place as president who had not bought the show. So they called me in and they didn't know what it was. They thought it was a kid's show because it was the Henson Company and they didn't want the sci-fi channel to be associated with kids' shows. So his phrase was, just make it as weird as possible. And so, uh, you know, I embraced that and, uh, and just, off, you know, off we went. And then as the series went on on Sci-Fi Channel, the um, the fan base that was growing was so passionate that um, and the very thing that they were embracing was that incredible boldness of the show. So um, the network, um, uh, you know, as the seasons went on, just became you know understood that this the very thing that that's making the show work is just how unpredictable it is and 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 the boldness of it. Um, and uh, so many things I can assign to that. Um, certainly um, our cast, which were all, so it's that kind of wonderful group of actors that you hope to get the alchemy of the, of the actors. I think the fact that you had Ben Browder, who was an American in Australia, all the other actors were Australian. There's different acting styles and, 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 you know, so that's kind of all at play in terms of uh, Ben being the fish out of water. Um, even behind the scenes, he was the you know the 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 American actor you know coming to Australia, um, and then the, just shooting in Australia, uh, which was and uh, you know it was originally just a, a, a financial consideration, um, uh, but we quickly learned just how um, important that was to the series. In that you just got to take advantage of all of that the 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 Australian artisans that were there, all those people that worked on, you know, um, Mad Max movies and things like that. And just the, the their wild imagination their, and, their, and the freedom that Australians, you know, embrace. And that just gave the show a, a very different look too. So all those things I think, you know, were contributed. In, in terms of like how the writing came across, um, what, what, what did the writer's room look like on some of those, like those wackier episodes when you guys really leaned into the weird? Um, uh, was it different than, say, any other kind of show that you did where you tried to do something similarly strange or like out of the ordinary? Not really. I mean, I, I, I tend to write, run my writer's rooms in the same way, right? And and we we had very few writers on on Farscape. It was we went through a lot of writers early on because it's just to get people to kind of tap into that that sensibility. But um, uh, Ricky Manning, Richard Banning, David Kemper, um, uh, 
uh, Justin Manjo, writers like that, totally got it. And um, so it was that kind of wild, not imagination, but sense of humor too, very, very important. Um, and uh, which made the writers' room, you know, a, 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 just fun, a lot of fun. But it also led to the kind of wilder moments. And you know, early on, we would in writers' rooms. Typically, it doesn't matter what show you're doing; you could do, be doing a, a regular network procedural. And just to make your to do your pitch, you might reference. You often reference other shows or other movies or things to kind of get your to sell what you get your point across and sometimes with humor and i would always and I, I told the writers i said put that in the show in other words let Crichton be um making references to uh you know um uh, tv shows and movies and whatever else you know um uh, because that's what he would do even if he knows that the the um the the aliens the species that he's speaking to have no idea what he's talking about I mean, that's part of the, the humor of it. Plus, it allows it's the sort of thing that the audience would be saying themselves, you know, or, you know, if they were when you, you know, you just kick back with your with your with your buds and watching some show, right? Here's making these kind of snarky comments and go give it to Crichton, let him let him say that. Yeah. When you were working on Farscape, uh, was there anything that you um, that you hadn't tried before that now you do kind of like make a practice to uh, in your your writing for doesn't even have to be sci fi, but just like fiction in general? Yeah, um, the thing that uh, I, I kind of the the show taught me, which uh, was um, just to embrace the conflict, to really just even characters who are who who are getting along, who are you know, um, find find the conflict in any scene between the between those two people or or amongst that group, and uh, and that's something I've definitely brought along with me uh, on on everything else that I do. Um, and I didn't invent the idea of conflict as a as a fuel for for drama. I don't think I was the one who invented that. But it was something that um, uh, Farscape uh, just because it was a show about a group of uh, escaping prisoners. And my mission with the show was I knew that eventually in any show when people are together for any length of time, no matter how fractious the relationships are early on, they grow into a family, you know, soon enough. And this is actually something very, uh, obviously very pleasing about that too, because you you like to see people, you know, as a family, like to watch people in, in family like like situations. Um, but I wanted to keep them as, as apart and fractious as long as possible. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'd say that that is probably the thing that um, I embrace so fully on this show that I've kind of carried it on to everything else that I do. Yeah, and at the first episode in season one where they kind of literally break bread together, like they're having dinner, then it gets interrupted and then it ends. I'm forgetting the name of the episode, but uh, that's one of the times that I felt like just really happy for these characters that they can uh, just finally sit down and enjoy each other's company without there being some even just small potatoes conflict. No, that's and a good, that's a that's a great yeah. observation. Yeah, but it's you earn that right by having mm -hmm. if 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 they were kind of getting along all the time, then that sh that scene would be yeah. just have it would be just tamped down some because it, we would you're not getting the mm -hmm. the full the full juice of it if you will. But because they're often you know at, at, at odds with each other, in first season we did an episode where in order to get home, which was their individual goals was to get back to their own home worlds they have to cut off one of pilot's arms right and pilot's like the most friendly benign you know he, he's helpful to them but yeah. they'll do that because in 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 you know in service to their own needs and that was i thought an important thing to do even as early as you know the middle of the first season to just kind of again throw throw some gasoline on that on the on the relationship fire if you will um, mm -hmm. and try to keep it as, as, as stirred up as, as possible for as long as possible. And, the those, those conflicts do actually like hit a very surprising note, especially early on in the show. So I, I commend you for not being afraid to like really just throw these guys into the fire. Well, literally when Crichton shows up in, uh, Moya's vicinity, it literally is throwing him into the fire, like in the worst possible situation save putting him directly into scorpius's lap but that's that's a little bit too geeky and slightly a little spoilery for uh people who may have not seen the show which <laughs> um I'm, I'm gonna pivot here and since we are celebrating the 25th anniversary of farscape shout factory has put out the entire series on blu-ray and like one giant box set which has been available since november it's just this year is the 25th anniversary so 
we're just talking to the creators and uh, writers and actors, uh, just, you know, discussing about the series that was so lucky to be in everyone's lives. Thank you so much, Rockney, for, for talking with me. Uh, and I have to say, I love that bust of Rigel on your background. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> it looks very cool. There he is. That's I can't stop looking uh, at him. It's a decapitated George Rigel. <laughs> well, uh, make sure to give him some food cubes for me. And I will. Um, thank you so much for, for talking with me today. It's been a pleasure. Be well. Take care.